sitting in any cryptocurrency address is only spendable to the person who holds its private key, which is a long alphanumeric string that your wallet probably keeps hidden away from you. This leaves one with the problem of keeping one's private keys safe, as any internet-enabled device, like your laptop, computer, or phone, is hackable, technically. And a hacked device with private keys on it means lost money. The solution to this problem came about very quickly after cryptocurrency was first invented in the form of what's called cold storage, or a cold wallet. To create a cold wallet, you simply use software that allows you to mathematically generate both a public address or key and a private address or key in an offline manner. You then write down that private address or key, these words are being used interchangeably here, on a piece of paper, or you engrave it in metal, or you even memorize it if you can. You can then send your funds to the public address, knowing that the private address required to spend them has never been stored on an internet-enabled device. The only real problem with this kind of wallet is that you can't spend from it, not without re-importing your private keys into a hot wallet, and then what was the point of the cold storage in the first place? That is why the dear old market gave us the solution of hardware wallets. Don't ask me how they work, it seems a little bit magic, but I know that they do work, and I know that because I own one. And at a user request, I am now going to show you how to use it. My particular device is manufactured by a company called Trezor. They live in Prague. And this device is compatible with several wallets. Uh, it's compatible with a web wallet, or I guess it's a, not a wallet, a web interface. This is the wallet. A web interface called My Trezor, as well as the wallets Multibit and Electrum. And with Electrum, it can support Bitcoin and or Dash. And with the other two, it just supports Bitcoin. Mine is not set up for Dash. I will be using Bitcoin today. So I've got to connect it to an internet-enabled device, as it itself is not. So with a cord, I just plug it into my laptop. And I'm going to set the device on the table so that you can see its commands as it comes up, because that will make them easier to read. So as soon as I've plugged it in, because I already, and yes, that's a bacon bandage on my finger, it asks me for a pin. And the order in which these numbers display every time I log in is scrambled. So that even if there were, say, a key logger on my computer maliciously recording my strokes, uh, the attacker wouldn't actually know my PIN, because I would enter it differently every time. All right, I've entered my PIN, and now it's asking also for a passphrase. The daily decrypt forever enter. All right, and so for the payment I want to show you today, I've decided to send a tip, a tip to Chris Ellis in particular. You may remember him as uh, the co-founder of the ProTip browser extension, which is neat. As you can see here, here's his address. I'll send him 50 cents. Excellent. And I press send here, and then you can see on the device, it asks me if that's really how much I want to send and if that's really who I want to send it to. And I say, yields. And it says, is that the transaction fee that I really want? Yields. So I have just spent a real Bitcoin transaction from cold storage. And I could have plugged this into any uh, internet-enabled device, like your computer or a computer at a library or something, and been confident that even if it had viruses or malware on it or whatever, uh, it has no way of letting the internet grab the private key from within the hardware wallet. So I think that hardware wallets may become widely used in the future as more and more people become their own banks and, you know, start acting like it. And Trezor is not the only device that does this, and so, yeah, if I haven't mentioned a hardware wallet that you yourself like, do please uh, share your review uh, in the description, or rather the comment section.